Section three of Stops or How to Punctuate A Practical Handbook for Writers and Students. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Miranda Stinson and Sarah Jennings. Stops or how to Punctuate by Paul Allardyce The Comma Rule 5. The comma indicates a short pause in a sentence. It is used when we wish to separate words that stand together, and at the same time to stop as little as possible the flow of the sentence. Example 1. When the Earl reached his own province, comma, he found that preparations had been made to repel him. Example 2. Though it is difficult, comma, or almost impossible, comma, to reclaim a savage, comma, bred from his youth to war and the chase, comma, to the restraints and duties of civilized life, comma, nothing is more easy or common than to find men who have been educated in all the habits and comforts of improved society, comma, willing to exchange them for the wild labors of the hunter and the fisher. Rule 6. Where there is no danger of obscurity, the subject must not be separated from the predicate by any point. Example 1. The eminence of your station gave you a commanding prospect of your duty. Rule 8. When the subject is long, a comma may be placed after it. Example 1. To say that he endured without a murmur the misfortune that now came upon him, comma, is to say only what his previous life would have led us to expect. In every sentence, the subject, whether expressed in one word or in several words, must be grasped as a whole, and, when the subject is long, one is often assisted in doing this by having a point to mark its termination. The eye at once observes the separating line. Note the corresponding pause in the reading of such sentences. Rule 8. When the subject consists of several parts, for example, of several nouns, a comma is placed after the last part. Example 1. A few daring jests, comma, a brawl, comma, and a fatal stab, comma, make up the life of Marlowe. Example 2. Time, comma, money, comma, and friends, comma, were needed to carry on the work. This rule will appear reasonable if we consider an apparent exception to it. When the last noun sums up all the others, or marks the highest point of a climax, no comma is placed after it. Example 3. Freedom, comma, honor, comma, religion was at stake. If religion be regarded as marking the highest point of a climax, the predicate is read with religion and with it alone. When so great a thing as religion is said to be at stake, everything else is dropped out of sight, or is held to be included. But write the three names as if they were of equal importance. The comma should then be inserted. Example 4. Freedom, comma, honor, comma, and religion, comma, we're at stake. But it is not necessary to use a point in such a sentence as this, time and tide wait for no man, for we see without the aid of a point that the predicate is to be read with the two nouns equally. The principle might be applied also in cases like the following, though few writers carry it so far. Example 5. It was the act of a high-spirited, comma, generous, comma, just nation. Example 6. It was the act of a high-spirited, comma, generous, comma, and just, comma, nation. Rule 9. Dependent clauses are generally separated from the rest of the sentence in which they occur. The usual point is the comma. Example 1. Be his motives what they may, comma, he must soon disperse his followers. Example 2. This relation of your own army to the crown will, comma, if I am not greatly mistaken, comma, 
become a serious dilemma in your politics. Of course, this rule must be qualified by the rules for the stronger points, especially by those for the semicolon and the colon. It is often necessary to separate the clause from the rest of the sentence by a strong point. Exceptions Part 1 No point is needed if either the dependent clause or the principal clause be short. Example 3 He would be shocked if he were to know the truth. But if the dependent clause be inserted parenthetically, it is marked off by commas or the other marks of parenthesis, however short it may be. See Rule 10. If the sentence last quoted were inverted, a comma would be placed after the dependent clause. Example 4. If he were to know the truth, comma, he would be shocked. In the first form of this example, he would be shocked is a definite, finished statement, the necessary qualification to which should follow with as little pause as possible. But in the inverted form, the first part of the sentence, if he were to know the truth, is not a finished statement, and the mind may pause for a moment before going on to the consequence, knowing that the consequence must follow. Part 2 no point is needed if there be a very close grammatical connection between the dependent clause and some word or words preceding it. Example 5. They had so long brooded over their own distresses that they knew nothing of how the world was changing around them. Note that by the word so, the clause that they knew nothing is joined very closely to the previous part of the sentence, and that the two clauses that they knew nothing, and how the world was changing around them, are even more closely joined to one another by the preposition of. For the same reason, where the object is a clause, there is no point before it. Example 6. He confessed to us that he had not thought over the matter. A useful distinction will afterwards be drawn between the different kinds of relative clauses. See Rule 14. Rule 10. Words thrown in so as to interrupt slightly the flow of a sentence are marked off by commas. Example 1. He resolved, comma, therefore, comma, to visit the prisoner early in the morning. Example 2. This, comma, I think, comma, is the right view of the case. Example 3. The first ideas of beauty formed by the mind are, comma, in all probability, comma, derived from colors. The following are some of the words and phrases that come under this rule. Therefore, to, indeed, however, moreover, then, accordingly, consequently. In short, in fine, in truth, in fact, to a certain extent, all things considered. This rule of high-pointing should be applied very sparingly, and might really be restricted to cases like the I think of the second example. Nowadays the tendency is against the pointing of such words as therefore and indeed. Where the words thrown in make a very distinct break in the sentence, they should be pointed off by means of the dash or of brackets. Rule 11. Where two parts of a sentence have some words in common, which are not expressed for each of them, but are given only when the words in which they differ have been separately stated, the second part is marked off by commas. Example 1. His classification is different from, comma, and more comprehensive than, comma, any other which we have met. Example 2. This foundation is a nursing mother of lay, comma, as distinguished from religious, comma, oratorios. These examples come within the principle of Rule 10. Rule 12. When words are common to two or more parts of a sentence, and are expressed only in one part, a comma is often used to show that they are omitted in the other parts. Example 1. London is the capital of England, semicolon. Paris, comma, of France, semicolon. Berlin, comma, of Germany. Example 2. In the worst volume of Elder Date, comma, the historian may find something to assist or direct his inquiries. Semicolon. The antiquarian, comma, something to elucidate what requires illustration. Semicolon. 
the philologist, comma, something to insert in the margin of his dictionary. Though many writers constantly punctuate contracted sentences in this way, it is not well to insert the comma when the meaning is equally clear without it. It is unnecessary in the following sentence. Example 3. Saul hath slain his thousands, comma, and David his ten thousands. Rule 13. Words placed out of their natural position in the sentence are often followed by a comma. Part 1. The object is usually placed after the verb. When placed at the beginning of the sentence, it should be separated from the subject by a comma, unless the meaning would otherwise be perfectly clear and readily seized. Example 1. The proportions of belief and of unbelief in the human mind in such cases, comma, no human judgment can determine. There is the same reason for inserting the comma in such cases as there is for inserting it after a long subject. Moreover, there is often need of some device to remove the ambiguities that are caused by inversion. In English, the meaning of words is so greatly determined by their position that, in altering the usual arrangement of a sentence, there is risk of being misunderstood. The danger of inserting the point in this case is that the object may be read with the words going before, and not with its own verb. If there is a possibility of this, the point should not be used. Of course, no point should be placed after the object in such a sentence as the following. One I love, and the other I hate. Part 2. An adverbial phrase, that is a phrase used as an adverb, is usually placed after the verb. When it begins the sentence, a comma follows unless it is very short. Example 2. From the ridge a little way to the east, comma, one can easily trace the windings of the river. Example 3. In order to gain his point, comma, he did not hesitate to use deception. Example 4. In ordinary circumstances, I should have acted differently. No point would be used in the above sentences if the adverbial phrases occurred in their usual position. Example 5. He did not hesitate to use deception in order to gain his point. Nor is any point used when, as often happens in such sentences, the verb precedes the subject. Example 6. Not very far from the foot of the mountain lies the village we hope to reach. Part 3. An adjective phrase, that is a phrase used as an adjective, is usually placed immediately after the word which it qualifies. When it appears in any other place, a comma is often usefully placed before it. Example 7. A question was next put to the assembly, comma, of supreme importance at such a moment. The phrase, of supreme importance at such a moment, is to be taken along with question. The comma shows that it is not to be taken along with assembly. There is here a further reason for the point, inasmuch as the phrase acquires from its position almost the importance of an independent statement. But, where the connection between the adjective phrase and the substantive is very close, and where there is no risk of ambiguity, no point is to be used. The morning was come of a mighty day. Such a sentence needs no point. Observe also that coordinate adjective phrases take a comma before them, wherever they are placed. See next rule. Rule 14. Adjective clauses and contracted adjective clauses are marked off by commas, if they are used parenthetically or coordinately. No point is used if they are used restrictively. See note 1. Example 1. The religio laici, comma, which borrows its title from the religio medici of Brown, comma, is almost the only work of Dryden which can be considered as a voluntary effusion. Example 2. That sentiment of homely benevolence was worth all the splendid sayings that are recorded of kings. Example 3. The advocates for this revolution, comma, not satisfied with exaggerating the vices of their ancient government, comma, strike at the fame of their country itself. Example 4. The ships bound on these voyages were not advertised. Example 5. Chapter 7, comma, where we stopped reading, comma, is full of interest. Example 6. The chapter where we stopped reading is full of interest. 
We must explain this distinction at some length, for, on the one hand, it is hardly ever observed, and, on the other hand, almost every sentence that we write furnishes an example of it. Examine the first sentence which we have quoted. It contains both a coordinate clause, which borrows its title, etc., and a restrictive clause, which can be considered as a voluntary effusion. In distinguishing them, we may begin by applying tests of almost a mechanical nature. Part 1. The first clause may be thrown into the form of an independent statement. The second cannot. Thus, the Religio Laici borrows its title from the Religio Medici of Brown. It is almost the only work, etc. Or, the Religio Laici, it borrows its title from the Religio Medici of Brown, is almost the only work, etc. We cannot in the same way destroy the close connection of the second clause with the only work of Dryden. Part 2. The first clause may be omitted and still leave a complete and intelligent sentence. If we were to omit the second clause, the sentence would cease to have any meaning. These tests may be practically useful, but they are rough and by no means infallible. Let us see the reason for the distinction. The name, religio laici, of itself tells us what the thing is spoken about. It is the name of one thing, and only of one thing. The clause that follows informs us, indeed, of the fact concerning the poem. But the information is given purely as information, not in order to keep us from confounding this religio laici with some other religio laici that did not borrow its title. Work of Dryden, however, is the name of a class, for Dryden wrote many works. Now the whole class is not here in question. It must be limited, narrowed, or restricted to one part of it, namely Dryden's voluntary effusions, and it is thus limited, narrowed, or restricted by the relative clause which can be considered as a voluntary effusion. Take another example, where the name in both cases is that of a class, and note the difference of meaning which results from different pointing. The houses in London which are badly built, comma, ought to be pulled down. The houses in London expresses a class of objects. The relative clause limits the name to a smaller class, the badly built houses, and the meaning is that houses of this smaller class ought to be pulled down. Now insert the comma. The houses in London, comma, which are badly built, comma, ought to be pulled down. The class is not narrowed, and the meaning is that all houses in London, seeing they are badly built, ought to be pulled down. The difference between the two kinds of relative clauses being understood, there will be no difficulty in implying the rule where an adjective clause is contracted. Compare the fourth example given under the rule with the following sentence. People not satisfied with their present condition, comma, should strive to alter it. In this sentence, not satisfied limits the general name, people. The advice is given only to one section of the people, the dissatisfied as distinguished from the satisfied people. So a single adjective may be used coordinately. Example 7. What? replied the emperor, comma, you do not see it? It is my star, comma. Brilliant. This is a case where a dash would be more expressive. Note that the rule applies only where the adjunct immediately follows the substantive. If the adjunct is placed elsewhere, different considerations apply. See Rule 13. Example 8. Neither can any man marvel at the play of puppets, comma, that goeth behind the curtain, and adviseth well of the motion. Footnote 1. To distinguish the different kinds of adjective clauses, different names have been used. Coordinating and restrictive, bain. Continuative and definitive or restrictive, mason. Rule 15. Words in apposition are generally marked off by commas. Example 1. James Watt, comma, the great improver of the steam engine, comma, died on the 25th of August, comma, 1819. 
But where the words in apposition are used in a limiting or distinguishing sense, the principle of Rule 14 applies, and no point is used. Thus we should write Burns, comma, the poet, Dickens, comma, the novelist. But, if we wished to distinguish them from another Burns and another Dickens, we should omit the comma. Example 2. It is of Pliny the naturalist, comma, not of Pliny the letter-writer, comma, that we are now speaking. Again, where the general name precedes, we should in most cases use no point, for the special name will be restrictive. The poet Burns, the novelist Dickens. There is perhaps not much authority for the consistent carrying out of this distinction, but it seems useful and logical. Some cases, such as Paul the Apostle, William the Conqueror, Thomas the Rhymer, Peter the Hermit, present no difficulty. The name and the descriptive title are blended together, and form as distinctly one name, as does Roderick Random. Rule 16. A conjunction marks a transition to something new, enforcing, qualifying, or explaining what has gone before, and is therefore generally preceded by some point. The proper point before a conjunction is determined by many circumstances, among others by the more or less close connection of the things joined, by the number of words, and by the use of points for other purposes in the same sentence. To deal with the different conjunctions one by one would involve a repetition of much that is said in other rules. For instance, if, unless, though, for, because, since, and the like, will be pointed in accordance with Rule 14. It will be well, however, to lay down separate rules for the pointing of the common conjunctions, and, and or, and. Part 1. Subpart 1. Where and joins two single words, as a rule no point is used. Example 1. No work has been so much studied and discussed. Compare this with the following sentence, where groups of words are joined. Example 2. The work has been much studied, comma, and has been much discussed. In the following sentence, the insertion of a comma would change the meaning. Example 3. On this shelf you will put books and pamphlets published in the present year. As the sentence stands, published in the present year applies both to books and to pamphlets. Books published in the present year and pamphlets published in the present year. If there were a comma before and, the meaning would be, on this shelf you will put books of any date and pamphlets of the present year. Subpart 2. When and joins the separate words of a series of three or more words, a comma is placed before it. Example 4. Trees, comma, and bridges, comma, and houses, comma, were swept down by the flooded stream. Subpart 3. But where the different words are intended to be combined quickly, so as to present to the mind only one picture, they would be spoken without any pause, and in writing must not be separated by any point. Example 5. Whirling and boiling and roaring like thunder, comma, the stream came down upon them. Subpart 4. Two of the words of the series may be more closely connected with one another than with the other words of the series, and are, therefore, not to be separated by any point. In the following sentence, all qualifies both tracts and pamphlets, and thus joins them closely. Example 6. My unbound books, comma, and all my tracts and pamphlets, comma, are to be tied up with pink tape. Subpart 5. When and occurs only between the two last words of the series, the comma is usually inserted before it. Example 7. Trumpets, comma, drums, comma, and kettle drums, comma, contended in noise with the shouts of a numerous rabble. Many writers omit this comma, but it seems useful in order to make the previous rule, subpart 4, effective. Part 2. When and joins two phrases, a comma generally precedes it. Example 8. The ceremony was performed in the accustomed manner, comma, and with due solemnity. If, as in the following sentence, a preposition is common to two phrases and is not repeated in the second, no comma is used. Example 9. With proper care and good instruments, comma, the work may be successfully carried out. Part 3. 
When AND joins two clauses, the preceding point may be the comma, the semicolon, or even the full stop. Which point is right in any particular case will depend on considerations set out in other rules. The following example illustrates different cases. Example 10. Within that charmed rock, comma, so Torridge boatmen tell, comma, sleeps now the old Norse Viking in his leaden coffin, comma, with all his fairy treasure in his crown of gold. And, comma, as the boy looks at the spot, comma, he fancies, comma, and almost hopes, comma, that the day may come when he shall have to do his duty against the invader as boldly as the men of Devon did then. And past him, comma, far below, comma, upon the soft southeastern breeze, comma, the stately ships go sliding out to sea. Or, the rules for the conjunction and apply with little change to the conjunction or, but there are one or two special points to note. Part 1. When or is preceded at no great distance by either or whether, the two words should be separated by no point. Example 11. They must either yield this point or resign. Example 12. It does not matter whether we go or stay. But a point is inserted if the words stand farther apart, or if each is followed by a complete clause. Example 13. Either this road leads to the town, comma, or we have misunderstood the directions. Part 2. Or, joining two alternatives, takes no point before it. But when it joins two words that are used not as real alternatives, but as synonyms, a comma is inserted. Example 14. England or France might be asked to join the alliance. Here, or is used as a real alternative conjecture, and therefore without any point. In the following example, the or joins equivalent expressions. Example 15. England, comma, or the nation of shopkeepers, comma, would never be asked to join such an alliance. Example 16. We perceive, comma, or are conscious of, comma, nothing but changes, comma, or events. As a reason for the insertion of the comma in these two examples, it may be said that the repetition of an idea already expressed does for a moment stop the flow of the sentence. A real alternative, on the other hand, forms an essential part of it, and is within its current. Rule 17. In cases where no point would be used before a conjunction, a comma is inserted if the conjunction be omitted. Example 1. I pay this tribute to the memory of that noble, comma, reverend, comma, learned, comma, excellent person. In the following examples no point occurs, for it cannot be said that a conjunction is omitted. To insert the conjunction would be to express a slightly different shade of meaning. Example 2. A grand old man. Example 3. Three tall young soldiers. Old man is virtually a single word, and in fact many languages use only a single word to express the idea. Rule 18. Where a comma would be used if the conjunction were expressed, some stronger point may be used if it be omitted. Example 1. Let us get an American revenue as we have got an American empire. English privileges have made it all that it is. Semicolon. English privileges alone will make it all that it can be. Rule 19. A comma is placed after a noun or a pronoun in the vocative case if a mark of exclamation be not used, or be reserved till the first distinct pause in the sentence. Example 1. Yet I own, comma, my lord, comma, that yours is not an uncommon character. Example 2. I am, comma, sir, comma, yours truly, comma, John Smith. Example 3. O Italy, comma, gather thy blood into thy heart. Mark of exclamation. Example 4. O thou, comma, who in the heavens dost dwell. Mark of exclamation. Whether a comma or a mark of exclamation ought to be used after the vocative case depends entirely on the degree of emphasis with which the words would be spoken. If, in speaking, a slight pause would be made, the comma, not the mark of exclamation is the proper point. Rule 20. 
If a word be repeated in order to give it intensive force, a comma follows it each time that it occurs. But in the case of an adjective repeated before a noun, not after the last expression of it. Example 1. It was work, comma, work, comma, work, comma, from morning till night. Example 2. He traveled a long, comma, long way. Dean Alford in The Queen's English says that this mode of pointing such expressions as the wide, wide world, the deep, deep sea, makes them absolute nonsense. The suggestion of a pause seems to us to bring out more effectively the intensive force of the repetition, and we doubt whether Dean Alford himself would have omitted the comma in our first example. End of section 3